Physically, what do magnets, Mexican hats and the early universe have in common? The answer has to do with some of the most groundbreaking physics and provides theories on the unification of two of the four fundamental forces of nature. Let's start things off simple and build up to the answer to my original question. Consider a magnetic material, such as a bar magnet or any metal. Below a certain temperature, such materials become ferromagnetic. This temperature is known as the Curie temperature, named after French physicist Pierre Curie, the husband of Marie Curie. Ferromagnets are permanent magnets, as is the case with bar magnets. They show their own permanent magnetic field, as opposed to paramagnets, which are materials that can be magnetised when in the presence of an external magnetic field, but don't generate their own. Above the Curie temperature, magnetic materials are paramagnets, and below it, they are ferromagnets. The reason why materials such as iron and cobalt are ferromagnets is due to their Curie temperatures being much higher than that at room temperature. However, above those temperatures, they would stop being permanent magnets. The Curie temperature is different for each magnetic material, which is why most metals display paramagnetism at room temperature, but as you cool them down, they will eventually behave as ferromagnets. This means that a phase transition occurs as you cool materials past their Curie temperature, as the material transitions between the paramagnetic and ferromagnetic phase. But what does this mean physically? What is magnetism and why is this transition so interesting? Magnetism in essence is a quantum mechanical phenomenon, however, I will try and explain it simply. Magnetism has its origin from the spin of electrons within atoms. Electrons, as you know, orbit the nucleus of atoms, and have a parameter known as spin, which is a type of angular momentum. Spin doesn't have a classical analogy, as it does not mean the electrons are spinning on any axis, although electrons can be thought of as having spins pointed up or pointed down. I'll represent this visually as an arrow. Magnetization arises from the net spin of a material. This means the total spin of all the electrons in a material determine how ferromagnetic it is. For example, if we had four electrons all spin up, the magnetization would be four units. For three up and one down, it would be two units. Two up, two down, it would have zero magnetization. Also, if the spins added to give a negative magnetization, such as one up and three down, then we would still call this ferromagnetic, as it has a net spin. They're just pointed opposite to our positive spin, which is just a labeling convention. So when a material is in a paramagnetic phase, it has no magnetization due to it not generating its own magnetic field, and so must have a magnetization equal to zero. Real materials often contain over 10 to the 23 electrons, and so you can imagine that over a random distribution of spin up and spin down, with that many electrons, you would almost always average approximately zero net magnetization. This is just a simple result from probability. Like, imagine tossing 10 to the 23 coins. If it's random, then due to how many there are, you would almost always get a percentage of 50-50 heads to tails. It's the same principle. This randomness is for the most part due to thermal fluctuations, causing the minimum energy configuration to be an even split of up and down spins. Nature likes to minimise energy. That's a key point to take away from this video. However, when cooled below the Curie temperature, these paramagnets spontaneously have their spins align in a single direction, giving them net magnetization and becoming ferromagnetic. This process is known as spontaneous symmetry breaking, and is of paramount importance. But hold up, wait a moment. You may be thinking that the ferromagnetic phase is more symmetric than the paramagnetic phase. Intuitively, that would make sense, right? If all the spins are aligned, as in the case in ferromagnetism, then this looks more symmetric than in paramagnetism when they're all over the place. However, you would be incorrect. It's a subtle point, but the paramagnetic phase is actually more symmetric. You can think of this as if you had many spins randomly aligned, then flipping just one of them, it would have almost no impact on the symmetry or overall order of the state. The bulk properties would still be the same. It would still on average have zero magnetization. However, in the ferromagnetic phase, it's only symmetric when all of the spins are flipped or changed at once. Flipping one of them ruins it, and so is less symmetric. This idea can be difficult to come to terms to, so let me use another more familiar phase transition as an example. As you know, below a certain temperature, liquids freeze into solids. So what I'm saying here is that liquids are more symmetric than solids, due to the molecules having random motion, and so flipping the picture or moving the liquid molecules randomly looks the same as if I hadn't touched it. Still just a random assortment of molecules. Whereas in solids, the atoms line up in consistent rows. If I was to rotate the picture by an angle, it would look totally different. Furthermore, if I was to displace a few atoms, the arrangement also looks much different. Therefore solids have less symmetry than liquids, which essentially look the same no matter what transformations you do on them. So when the system goes below a critical temperature, a phase transition happens and the symmetry breaks. Now let's examine what this means graphically. 
Going back to the paramagnetic phase, if I were to plot magnetization on the x-axis and free energy on the y-axis, the paramagnetic phase would look like this. A source of single well shape with the minimum at the origin of zero magnetization. Remember, I said nature loves to minimize energy, and so naturally the state will be at zero magnetization, hence why it's a paramagnet. Now as the material is cooled and transitions to the ferromagnetic state, you can see the graph will change and become something that looks like this. A source of double well, with the double well minima being below that of the single well. Let me explain. We observe that below the Curie temperature, materials become ferromagnetic, and so nature must have found a lower energy point at a magnetization greater than zero. Hence the wells are not at zero magnetization as they display ferromagnetism, and as we observe a phase change, we know they must be at a lower energy than the paramagnetic state. Also, a slight side note, that the energy of the minima is negative, and that's okay. In physics, only relative energies matter, which allows you to set your zero energy point anywhere. Moreover, the arrangement is a double well with a negative minima of equal depth, since remember the system has to choose whether to align all its spins up or all down, giving either positive or negative net magnetization. This choosing to go up or down is random, and both are possible with the same magnitude of magnetization, just a different direction. So both lead to permanent magnets and behave basically the same, hence we have a double well. Now the next important thing to consider is the symmetry break I mentioned earlier. The high symmetry state, i.e. the paramagnetic single well, is completely symmetric. If you were stood at the minima, each side looks exactly the same. But as the symmetry breaks and we transition into the double well ferromagnetic state, the minima shifts to one side, and so if you imagine a ball initially at the origin, denoting the position of the system, whichever side the ball rolls into, it will no longer be in a symmetric state, as now each side will look different e.g. the right side heads off to infinity, whereas looking left you'll see the slight bump at the origin and then the infinite wall. And so the broken symmetry can also be seen on the graph. Ok, now that the fundamentals have been discussed, what happens if instead of just magnetism we have another physical phenomenon which has a spontaneous symmetry breaking transition? There's lots of these, not just magnetism. For example, liquid to solid, or paraelectric to ferroelectric, or normal to superconducting. Let's classify the parameter which describes the phenomenon as the order parameter. This would be the magnetization for the magnetic case. So the order parameter is zero in the symmetric state and non-zero in the broken symmetry state. I've denoted it by the Greek letter phi in the diagram. So now we have two order parameters, which technically quantify a scalar field, but for this introductory video, don't worry too much about its meaning. We now need a 2D axis, one for each of them, so now we're looking at 3D graphs. In the symmetric state, the graph looks like a bowl sort of shape. And when the symmetry is broken, we get the shape shown here. You can imagine taking the previous 1D graphs and rotating them around the previous y-axis through the origin to produce the new two-order parameter graphs. Look at the shape of the 2D graph. It's now got a circular valley instead of two minima. This potential is shaped like the bottom of the inside of a wine bottle or a Mexican hat, and so is inventively named the Mexican hat potential. Think back to my initial question. This is what magnets and Mexican hats have in common. But what's so interesting about the energy Mexican hat potential? Well, imagine again our ball, which represents the state of the system. In the Mexican hat potential, it will very quickly fall down the slope and reach the bottom of the valley. This ball can then oscillate and be excited in two modes, and I'll show them both here. The first is an oscillation up and down the slope radially. I'll show it on the 1D plot too. This system has no friction, and so the ball will be oscillating up and down via this small perturbation. The other excitation can only be seen in the Mexican hat potential, and that's when the ball moves circularly around the bottom of the valley. This is also known as rolling around the gutter. These two modes have significant physical meaning. The first mode involves moving up and down and changing the potential of the ball. This therefore requires energy in order to do so, as it's moving up and down the y-axis. Physically, this manifests as a massive excitation. Put simply, a particle. Yes, when a system oscillates this way, in the potential, it produces a particle with mass. Alternatively, the other mode is rolling around the gutter. The ball doesn't change y-axis or energy position, and so this excitation has no energy change associated with it. Therefore, this is a massless excitation, also known as a goldstone mode, named after one of the scientists who theorised it. The particles produced from this excitation are massless and called goldstone bosons. Going back to our initial magnetism model, the massless excitations are known as magnons, which physically manifest as a spin wave through the ferromagnet. So when symmetry is broken, one of the things it gives rise to are excitations, aka a new particle spectrum. If we had three scalar fields, and so three order parameters, 
The broken symmetry state would have a minima which lies on the surface of a sphere instead of the circle in the gutter. This would give two massless excitations, one for each direction on the sphere. For every spontaneously broken symmetry you get a Goldstone boson. This is known as Goldstone's theorem. However, we had three order parameters and three fields, yet only two Goldstone modes. This means that one symmetry of the system is unbroken. There's still one line along which rotations on the graph look symmetrical. In 2D, this would be up through the centre of the Mexican hat. One final minute detail worth mentioning before discussing what this has to do with the early universe is that of local symmetries. These are symmetries like the magnetic ordering, which require an additional field known as a gauge field to keep their symmetry throughout spacetime. Without spending the next hour going through the maths of gauge fields, it's important to know that they must have massless excitations, otherwise the local symmetry would be broken to begin with. When the local symmetry does spontaneously break, like with the ferromagnetic phase, the excitations of the gauge field become massive, since the local symmetry has now been broken, so it's fine for the gauge field to have massive particles which further breaks the symmetry. So importantly for each spontaneous broken symmetry, we get a massless excitation from that field, i.e. a Goldstone boson, as well as a separate gauge field becoming massive, creating a gauge boson which has mass. What then happens is the massless Goldstone boson gets absorbed by the massive gauge boson and disappears. Remember though that the other broken global symmetries not associated with gauge fields still produce a Goldstone boson, so we can still have massless excitations even when one gets absorbed by a gauge boson. This is a key difference between local and global symmetries, and the effect of gauge fields. This is how we can have different bosons in particle physics, which can be massless like photons and gluons, as well as massive, such as the weak force mediators, the W and Z bosons. This entire process giving mass to the gauge bosons is known as the Higgs mechanism. The idea of symmetry breaking in different ways to give different types of particles is quite a difficult idea to understand, so don't worry, the rest of the video will still hopefully make sense, but it's worth talking about. Now that I've discussed massless and massive excitations, as well as gauge fields, I can get on to the perplexing crux of this video regarding the early universe. You likely know of the four fundamental forces of nature, that is, the strong force, the weak force, the electromagnetic force, and gravity. And as previously mentioned, the particles which mediate the weak force, i.e. the W+, W-, and Z0 bosons, have masses. Furthermore, the W bosons are charged, which means they interact electromagnetically with its force mediator, the photon. It's very strange how the mediators of one of the fundamental forces contains charge, which is the fundamental unit associated with interactions of another fundamental force. Moreover, these bosons are massive, and the photon is massless. We've just seen a theory which describes how gauge bosons are able to become massive once their associated symmetry is broken. So these observations imply that since our massive gauge weak force bosons are charged and therefore able to interact with the massless photon gauge boson, they could in fact be of the same origin, whereby some local symmetries were broken, giving the massive weak force gauge bosons, but some symmetries were not, retaining a massless goldstone mode, i.e. the photon. This would be a unified electromagnetic and weak nuclear force field whereby below some temperature, three separate scalar fields associated with the weak force have their symmetry spontaneously broken, which in turn allows the associated gauge fields to break symmetry and their bosons to absorb goldstone modes and become massive, which gives rise to the W plus and W minus and Z naught bosons. Whilst the single electromagnetic field retains its symmetry, meaning the photon is not absorbed by any gauge bosons and remains massless. This entire process is much more complicated mathematically, and really requires a good understanding of how symmetry groups can be represented by sets of matrices, and critically evaluating how each should interact with different types of particles. Doing so leads to the prediction of the Higgs boson, and also gives way of how non-bosonic particles, i.e. fermions, are able to get their mass. The maths involved in this is way beyond the level of this video. However, this does mean that the existence of mass in everyday objects, as well as the discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012, is strong supporting evidence for the electroweak theory. The reason this is to do with the early universe links all the way back to the beginning when I mentioned that spontaneous symmetry breaking happens below a certain temperature, e.g. the Curie temperature for magnetism. Well, it turns out that the temperature for the electroweak symmetry breaking is around 10 to the 15 Kelvin, meaning that naturally the only time this temperature was able to be achieved was in the early universe, when it was dense and hot, approximately one trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. Here, the electroweak symmetry wasn't broken, meaning those two forces were one of the same. These sorts of temperatures can only be recreated in particle detectors, which is how the Higgs boson was able to be discovered. This answers my original question, asking how magnets, Mexican hats and the early universe are related. Magnets show spontaneous symmetry breaking, which can be described by the Mexican hat potential, and then applied to the high temperatures of the early universe and unification of the electromagnetic and weak fundamental forces. 
So big props to you if you knew the answer from the beginning. Interestingly, there's ideas that this could be extended to include the strong nuclear force, when the universe was even younger and even hotter, in what's known as the Grand Unified Theory. Here, three of the fundamental forces were merged as one, and only split into the strong and electro-weak due to a different spontaneous symmetry breaking. This could give rise to supersymmetry and supersymmetric, or sussy, particles. If you were able to keep going and eventually include gravity into another unified force, thereby combining all four fundamental forces, you would reach the fabled theory of everything. However, modern physics is still a long way from this, needing a theory of quantum gravity first. Modern physics currently has two dominant theories which are capable of explaining and predicting many phenomena. Quantum mechanics, and by extension quantum field theory and the standard model of particle physics, work really well at describing the universe at atomic scales, whereas general relativity, as formulated by Einstein, explains the large-scale structure of space-time and the fabric of the universe itself, in particular the long-range interaction of gravity. In non-relativistic limits, general relativity collapses back to Newtonian physics, and in macroscopic limits, so too does quantum mechanics. The problem comes with gravity, which is unable to be described on a small scale due to how weak it is compared to the other three forces. So in order to reach a theory of everything, a theory of quantum gravity is needed first. Ideas such as M-theory, or as you may know it as, string theory, and also loop quantum gravity attempt to do so. But so far, no one has cracked it as of yet. Although, it's awesome to think about how these fundamental theories describing reality and the universe can be argued and come about due to such a simple concept as symmetry breaking. If you've enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing. Only a small amount of people who watch my videos are actually subscribed. It's free, it helps out my channel a bunch, and you can always unsubscribe. I hope no matter your physics background, you've learnt something new from this video and found it interesting, even if a lot of it contains some really advanced physics. See you next time.